All right. Good evening. This is our midweek Bible study, and I'm Steve Clay. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's, and we are moving into a new Bible study night. So if you want to be taking your Bibles, turn to the book of Micah. Um, just turn over from Jonah. It's the next page. Um, so we're going to be starting into that um, here and shortly. But let's just go over the announcements and update our prayer list. Um, like I say, Sunday school, we're continuing with our 9 a.m. Um, startup, Faithful Workers class in the sanctuary. So we'll have that going on. And then at 10 o'clock, we do our broadcast. Um, so we have services inside the sanctuary if you feel comfortable there. If you don't and you want to remain in your vehicle, you can sit out in the parking lot and you can listen to it on 87.9. Then we also broadcast a sermon over Facebook um, when all that's cooperating. We are still practicing... Um, basic COVID protocol, um, asking that you wear a mask when you come in. When you get to your seat, if you've been fully vaccinated, you can remove it. Um, so like I say, um, then just refrain from the hugging and handshaking as much as possible. I know it's hard for a lot of people, but we're just being careful um, as COVID's still moving around. Um, it's getting better, but we have had some people put on a prayer list recently because of COVID. So it's not gone yet. Um, Updates um, to the prayer list. If you have any names that you want to remain, we're going to clean the um, prayer list off. And like I say, we're just going to put those names back on because sometimes we have people who put names on and they forget to come back and clear them off. But like I say, if you want a name to stay on the prayer list, just contact Tommy and Vonda and they'll make sure it stays on there. We're not definitely not trying not to pray for somebody, but we also want to be focusing on those people um, who do need prayer because sometimes people put things on the prayer list and never come back and give the prayers report that the prayer has been answered or whatever. So like I say, we want to just keep it current. Um, then also, um, during the month of September, we're collecting any items for the Christmas shoe boxes. Just remember, no liquids, no candies. And like I say, just refrain from military insignia type stuff. Um, in some areas of the world, that is very dangerous um, to the children. So we don't want to get any um, thing like that there. So just keep that by. And then also remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. And then also birthdays and anniversaries this week. We have a couple birthdays. Um, Sunday was Kay Davis's birthday, and we wished her a happy birthday. And then the 29th, which will be um, a couple days from now, Jennifer Milgren will be having her birthday. So we wish her a happy birthday. Um, prayer list. Um, Marianne Edwards, Ronnie Locklear, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, Mike and Teresa Ivey, Shirlene Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, um, Karen Clegg. Um, she's been fighting with them today on the scheduling of these um, scans that the CS have. Um, so we need prayer for getting them scheduled properly and then also um, praying for good results from them and that we get answers for what's going on there. Um, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis. Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow, Joe Pate, Van Garganis, Eugene Florian Eford, Shannon Britt, Chloe Akers, and like I say, Chloe um, is making good progress, astounding um, the therapist, um, doing some great things um, that they weren't expecting already, and she is trying to talk, and I think if I understood right, um, what I shared Sunday is her first word is data, so that was an amazement in, in that in itself. Um, Janet House, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, Billy is, you know, weak, um, need to keep him in prayer. Dan and Mary Beard. Dan is having a hard time right now, so continue to remember Dan. Um, Amanda Kane, Linda Canelius Hunt, First Family, Daryl Britt, Nash White, Lisa Ray Rodriguez, Bobby Pate, Patsy Butler, Wanda Carter, Kyle Edwards, Supreme Court, Ronnie King, William Scott, Deborah Holbrook, Dan Hurley, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Freddie McBroom, Lee Stevens, um, Cynthia McMara, Ashley and Zaley Emmon, and Tommy gave us an update. Um, baby Zaley has a condition called BPD, um, so it's causing some problems with her lungs. So, like I say, um, be in prayer for that little baby. Is it's um, like I say, it was born premature and it's fighting. So, like I say, we need to be in prayer for that baby. Tracy Thomas um, having um, reaction to the radiation treatments she went through. Um, like I say, she's having a lot of sores and blistering, and they're afraid it's going to get infected. She's got so many, so keep her in your prayers. Paulette Faison, B.J. Norris, Susan Warren, Mike Smith, the family of Wayne McLean, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost, our nationist leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their family. 
Also, we want to remember Jeff Gray, um, also Deborah Gray. Um, she had an appointment today with a doctor. Have not heard any update there. Jeanette Allen um, broke her leg. Um, Hunter Kinlaw um, has stage four cancer, so remember that young man. Christy Moore, friend of Karen's in Ohio, um, thrown from horse, has broken ribs, um, punctured lung, but the lung is healing and she's been back to the doctor. Um, pregnancy support centers, um, several of them are getting threatened ever since the abortion laws have come through. Several have been getting threatened, so continue to pray for them. Continue to remember Luck as his arm is healing. Um, Miss Barbara is still under the weather. And then Amy is asking for a prayer for Jamie Hetzinger's grandmother who has COVID. Like I say, COVID's not gone away. Um, David Ivey um, will, is, was waiting transport. He's probably already there going to Duke for heart surgery. Um, remember the family of Cutler Balance. Um, remember Sheila Milligan. And then Dottie Lou Foley um, had a stroke. So remember her. Um, Brenda Pilgrim, um, COVID. Um, so, and then also I saw a note out um, that Ronnie Price, good friend of mine, um, has finished his radiation treatments um, where he had radiation had to have it on his scalp, um, where the can skin cancer had gone all the way to the bone. So he has finished up those treatments. So pray for healing there. So that's a very tender spot. So a lot of things going on. Remember our schools. There's another shooting in Philadelphia today. I believe I understood right. Five football players were shot coming off the practice field or coming off the field today at one of the high schools in Philadelphia. So just a drive-by shooting pulled up and just opened fire on them. So like I say, um, a lot of gun violence. We had a recent incident in our school here in St. Paul's. Somebody tried to bring a gun onto campus and they're saying they're having a lot of fights on the school campuses between the, um, the youth. So like I say, we just need to be in prayer for our schools and our children. and that we can get these things under control. So, Lord, you know, keep that in your prayers. Definitely be praying for the situation with the war in Ukraine. Things are just getting crazier and crazier. Um, additional wars broke out in Armenia and Azerbaijan, I think is how you say it. Skirmish is there, as well as a couple other areas. Um, so, like I say, just a lot of different things going on around the world, and we just need to be in prayer for them. Okay, um, like I say, several would indicate Sunday of personal and private concerns, so definitely keep those. And don't be bashful about giving God praise. Um, if you have something that's happened, give God the praise. Um, definitely in your private prayers, but also publicly if it's something that you can share. Um, give God praise. Um, because it's important that we do give Him praise. Um, like I say, I've been talking with my son. Um, he's been interviewing for a new job. They offered it to him um, yesterday, and he took it. So like I say, um, he'll start a new job in a couple weeks, and it'll be a traveling type of job, which means he'll be on the road a lot. So like I say, we'll be praying for safe um, travels for him in his new job. But it's something that he felt he needed to do. Um, so like I say, we'll be praying all goes well with that. And then like I say, um, a lot of people are still traveling. The weather hasn't gotten real cold or people are batting down the hatches. Then we have the storm sitting down in the Gulf. Um, already has gone through Cuba. Praying for all those individuals. Anytime these storms come up through, you know, somebody, it seems like somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hit hard. So we pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. For all those individuals. Um, I'd rather just see the storm just dissipate and go away. But instead, you know, like I say, it's the way the world was created and it's the way the earth create dissipates heat that builds up the equator. I understand all the physics of it, but it doesn't mean I can't pray for these things not to be as damaging as they, are, they can be. Um, so like I say, be praying that everyone can be safe around those things as that thing moves through the, during this week. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we just praise you and give you glory. Father, you've blessed us in many ways. Sometimes I don't even think we think about it. Things happen in all inner blessings. And Father, we just want to thank you. From the time we got up this morning, that you allowed us to get up this morning and get moving and the different things have happened throughout the day. Lord, you've blessed us with a good day. And sometimes bad things happen during the day, but that doesn't make the day bad. It's a good day because you've given it to us and it is good. And Father, we just pray to you to continue to watch over us and bless us and 
Lord, help us to be aware that we can sing your praises more, that we can thank you more for the blessings and all that. We'll just be attuned to them, Lord, and be able to share with our people. Look how God has blessed me. Look at the things God's done, and maybe we can be an influence on them in other ways, showing them what a caring God you are. Excuse me. But Lord, we just also pray for those on our prayer list. Father, we have several on our prayer list that are shut-ins and Father, we, we know they'd like to be with us. They'd like to be participating in different activities. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them, Lord, and keep them closed and strengthen their bodies, Lord. Heal them. And some of them are just to a point where they just can't get out anymore. And Lord, we understand that. But Lord, let them feel your presence. Let them know that you're there. And Father, we, we can feel their prayers because they're praying for us, as many have told us. Over the recent, over times that they pray for us as well, and Father, we just bless them and show us ways to minister to them that they can feel still part of the church and and feel your presence, Lord. And that's the most important thing to feel your presence. Bless and keep them, Lord. And Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones recently. Lord, it's never easy. Father, bless them and keep them as they go through the grieving process. It's not over in three days. Like, you know, a lot of companies say, well, you get three days off for a funeral. It's not over in three days. It can last for a long time. It can come back and, and bite you, so to speak. At other times, you know, a year or two years, as you have a special memory or something happens. Father, we just pray for those individuals. And Father, we pray for those who have upcoming tests, Lord, they don't know the results yet, but you do. Lord, we just pray that you'll be with them as to go through these tests, give them comfort and peace, and know that you're in control, Lord. And Lord, we give you the praise for those who have recently had surgeries and procedures. And Father, we just pray that you continue to heal their bodies and strengthen them. And Father, we pray for those who are battling th things like cancer and long-term conditions. Father, strengthen their bodies. Heal them, Lord. Make them whole and complete that they can be about your business and that they can give a testimony about all the blessings you've poured upon them in their healing. And Lord, we just pray for our schools. There's a shooting in Philadelphia today. I understand five young men were shot. Needlessly. Father, we pray for peace to come to our school campuses. That people will leave the guns at home, the fighting at home, and will come to school to learn, to grow together, and make friendships, and bond together, and, and mature, Lord. We do not need the violence on our school campuses. We do not need the drugs, the drama, and all the other mess that the world wants to throw in there. Protect our children, Lord. And may they grow up wise and strong and obedient to you. Father, we pray for our local First responders, Lord, for our police officers, our firefighters, all those that come in and help others, Lord. Bless them, Lord, and keep them safe as they go about their duties each day and helping others. And may they return home to their families safe each night. And Father, we pray for our military. Many of us know military and have know those who have served and those who, you know, are still serving. And Father, bless them. Father, there's so many of them scattered around the world in hot spots, so to speak. And Father, protect them, keep them, Lord. We do not want them to be drawn into a battle or a war. And Father, we want them to be able to come home safely to their family and friends. And Father, bless and keep them, Lord. And Father, we pray for our churches. Father, bless the churches. May they be about your business. May your will be done. May we, your kingdom be. May we live and show people what the kingdom of heaven can be like as we try to live it out here on earth. We can just give a pale comparison, but we can show them the goodness of it. Father, use us. Do not let us be dead in our spirit. Do not let us be dead or complacent in our activities. But let us move about. And let us urge people and compel them to come to church. That they may meet you in a worship service. That they may find you in a song of praise or a prayer or a message. 
Father, we pray that the church can be revised, revitalized, and stronger. That we'll strive to fill the pews for people who need to hear the gospel. Lord, there's more people out there who need to hear the gospel than who have heard it. Father, move us towards them and may we invite them. And Father, we pray. Father, we pray that you'll guide us and direct us. And Lord, if we move forward, may all that we do be to your glory. May we be faithful servants. Bless this Bible study. Bless this time that we will bring glory to your name. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we're in the book of Micah. Um, we're starting a new Bible study. Um, we might want to call this uh, my turn to page Bible, um, Bible study series. It's just, we're just walking through the minor prophets. And some of these books, a lot of Christians never spend much time in at all. Usually just a verse or two here or there. Um, not an in-depth Bible study. Um, of course, those reading through the Bible will read through them, but many times a Bible study or a systematic look at them is not there. And also, we, we don't grab a lot of it. And also, we're going to start out with sort of a first, you know, a brief overview before we get into the first chapter, just kind of introduce us to it. Now, the prophet Micah's name is an abbreviated form of Micaiah, which means, who is like Jehovah? And the minute I read that, I'm like, you know, there's a song, I can't think of the Christian song, but I remember one of the lines is, who is like Jehovah? And um, he was from the village of Morsheth, near Gath, um, which is about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. He prophesied during the last half of the 8th century BC. So, and then during that time was the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So three three kings. Um, he was a contemporary of Isaiah, um, who was in Judah and Amos and Hosea that were in Israel. I think it's interesting to see how these prophets were active at the same time. We got several prophets here that are kind of overlapping here. I think too often we think that well, there's Isaiah and then Jeremiah and then and we think they came in this order chronological, not realizing that they were you know overlapping. And like I say, many of them doing, doing their work, you know, at the same time in this, with the same groups of people and sometimes other groups of people. That's, you know, separated them and all. And sometimes they were dealing with the same topics that other prophets were, or they may have been dealing with other things that God was leading them to convey to the people. So like I say, I think sometimes we just miss it. And, you know, we don't put it all together. But I think it's important that we recognize that, and maybe as we go through these smaller studies um, on these smaller minor prophets, that we'll recognize this more. So, you know, looking at Micah, you know, during Jotham's reign, Assyria grew stronger. When Ahaz ascended the throne, both Syria and Israel tried to pressure him into joining a rebellion against Assyria. Now, I cannot, you know, help us stress, but we've seen this before in our Bible studies, you know. When other people are trying to get you to join in their fight, beware. Because many times what happens is you get drawn into a fight and it goes against God's will. And there's things that happen that, you know, kings have entered into these alliances without consulting God. Because really, if God wants a, a nation destroyed, he'll destroy them on their own. He don't need a whole group of people to go against them. And all he needs is, you know, the side that he's going, and that's it. So, like I say, um, Jeremiah twenty six eighteen informs us that it was the ministry of Micah that encouraged the Great Reformation. So, Micah made an impact in Judah under the leadership of Hezekiah. So, you know, the Reformation under Hezekiah was what you know Micah brought about, which is you know an important thing. Um, now, society in Judah was rapidly changing from rural to urban. Remember, Israel and Judah and Samaria, all that area, is an agrarian culture. But as trade is increased and everything, it becomes more urban. And so we see this um, more urban. And then also, we don't think much about it, but there's this thing going on, and it was a defiance to the law of God. 
um, which was given to Moses. You know, the wealthy investors were rapidly um, buying up the small family farms. And I think we can recognize this because we used to have a lot of family farms <clears throat> in the Robinson County area. And a lot of them got bought out. A lot of farms have been bought out by people and investors and what they do. <clears throat> they went out and they built houses on it and put trailer parks. And also we lost a lot of the farming and talking with the farmers and a lot of them just couldn't afford it anymore. They couldn't make enough off of the crops to sustain the farm. And so what was happening is these richer people were buying up all these small family farms and creating huge land holdings. And God did not design or set up Israel to be that way. And so, you know, this goes against God's will. And, you know, we saw this out in the Midwest. Um, a lot of Midwestern areas, as I understand, now are owned by corporations, not by farmers. But corporations who have bought out the farms. Now, some of the farmers still get to work some of their land. Some of them don't. Literally, they've been off. The, they've been moved off their land as they couldn't make it, and they went through bankruptcy. And corporations have bought them. So, like I say, there's just all kinds of things, and God just didn't want it to be that way. And so now you had an issue that you know this happening was creating problems for the poor, the small farmer being a poor person, right? And so Micah, you know, was from a farming community. And he kind of championed the oppressed poor and rebuked the robber barons. There's a term for you, right? The robber barons for their selfishness. And then also Amos later comes on and echoes the same message um, concerning the same thing. So like I say, uh, Micah saw the coming judgment of Israel under Assyria that would occur in 722, as well as the fall of Jerusalem and Judah under the Babylonians in 605 or 606. To 596, he sought to call the um, Jews back to faithful worship of Jehovah and sincere, so said a sincere uh, obedience to covenant, but they refused to listen. Boy, there's an interesting one, right? People refusing to listen. That still goes on today. And he pled for social justice, a concern for the helpless. And God, remember, several times in Scripture, what's he talk about? Take care of the widows, the orphans, the poor, the strangers in your land. We're supposed to do that. And they were ignoring these principles that God had established. And he was calling them back, and the people would not repent of that. So we'll see that as well as we go through Micah. So as we start out into this, the first two chapters of Micah will deal with the coming judgment. And... Um, so we'll see that. We won't get through both chapters. We'll just get through the first part of the, um, probably through the first chapter. And I'll, so like I say, we'll, we'll get through part of the first part. First, first, sorry about that. So now, just a little comparison from history. King David, um, he had a great many talented men in the army. And what made the ones that were the most valuable him were the men of Issachar. And we don't hear much about, you can go back and look at it in Chronicles. They had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Some people, God just blesses wisdom. They understand and they can foresee the things that God are doing and understand this is where we're heading. And they moved themselves this way. And so like I say, what did they do? When they saw the, the th changing of the times, they abandoned the ill-fated house of Saul. They saw Saul was a sinking ship. He had sinned against God. He was, you know, making the wrong decisions and everything. And they joined forces with David. And of course, God had chosen David to be the replacement king. And so they obediently moved in the direction that God was moving. Isn't it nice? And I think it's something we as Christians, we fail to see God moving, so we don't move with him. If we were more in tune with God, we'd see God moving, and we would move with him. And that's something we need to strive for. Um, like I say, Micah of Morsheth was a man who had the same kind of discernment. That's, so that's why they're kind of giving us a comparison. He saw where God was moving. He saw what God was up to, and he moved towards that. And he, God was able to give him the insight of the changes that were taking place both nationally and internationally. He wasn't just looking at Israel or Samaria. He was looking at all the area around it, and God was showing him these things. Now, Micah received three messages from the Lord to deliver to the people in hopes that they would abandon their idolatry. Um, and return to the, God's service. And the problem of it is, 
a lot of people don't see idolatry as wrong. We have Christians today who practice idolatry and don't even know they're doing it. You say, Steve, how can you practice idolatry and not even know to do it? Well, when you put other things ahead of God, that becomes a God. That becomes your idol. If it's more important to play golf on Sunday with your friends than to go to church, and that's what you're going to do time in and time out and forsake the you know, worship of God, then you're putting something else in front of God. If your car and you know, your money and your wealth investments are more important than investing into the kingdom of God, then that is your God. That is idolatry. It doesn't have to be a little wooden statue on a shelf or something. Idolatry can be anything that you put ahead of God and see as a higher priority. And many of Christians are practicing idolatry in the churches today. And they don't even know it. Because they don't see it as that. Because they look around and say, well, that's the way society is today. And I'm just going with what society does. We're not called to go along with society. We're called to be lighthouses. We're called to be salt of the earth. We are not going to be in compliance with everybody else. Their goals are not our goals. To me, Christians want this goal of all the other people who are not Christians. They want the fancy vacation home and fancy vehicles and all that. And there's nothing wrong with that. If, if God's blessed you and you can have those things, but don't put those things ahead of God. I knew a gentleman um, when I was living in Gastonia. And when you met him, you thought, here is, you know, a down-to-earth dude. And he was down-to-earth. It was so comical. He would carry this little, and this is going to date me a little bit, and how long ago was he? He carried a little transistor radio in his pocket of his jacket. And he had earplugs that came out of it. And so on nights at the, I think he was a Carolina fan. Yeah, can't be perfect, right? And so he would listen to the Carolina ball game. While he was sitting in choir practice on whatever Tuesday or Wednesday night or Tuesday night or whatever it was, we practiced choir. And he would have that radio, you know, in his ear. He was listening he loved that little thing. But the man actually was fairly wealthy. He had done quite well. He owned several businesses. I remember going over to his house and you know there was three Mercedes Benz parked in the garage. And and the thing about it was it, you never knew it talking with him. He, he didn't use, he didn't serve his wealth, his wealth served him. And he was very good about blessing other people and taking care of things. So like I say, he was using his blessings in the right way from the best that I could see at the time. And like I say, he, he seemed a very down to earth. He was not trying to put on airs or you know do anything. And so I thought it was a very interesting thing. I was surprised when he gave us the address of the house when we pulled up and I saw it. And I'm like, wow, this is not what I expected from this gentleman who was sitting, you know, in church with a transistor radio listening, you know, during choir practice, listening to a ball game. And, you know, he wasn't dressed to the tees or anything. He dressed, you know, normal as anybody else. And also, like I say, he was not allowing his money to control him. He was not worshiping it. It was serving him as God had blessed him. And God had blessed him very well. Um, so, like I say, in this... There's a lot of Christians practicing idolatry. Do not become one of them. It is a disease and it can destroy a church. Be careful. I'll put that caution out there. And Micah's is going to talk to you about some of these things as we go through. So like I say, the first message of Micah runs from the first chapter all the way to halfway through the second chapter. And it's a warning that divine judgment is coming to Judah and Israel or Samaria um, as it was, it's been called in several places and this message is fulfilled um, there's no doubt we know historically it was fulfilled in 722 BC when Assyria came in and defeated Israel or Samaria <clears throat> and then in 606 to 586 BC the Babylonians kept coming and invading and what did they do they destroyed um, they invaded Judah they destroyed Jerusalem the temple they took thousands of people captive um, to Babylon so like I say, when a servant of God speaks, it pays to listen. And the people of Israel were being told, not only by Micah, but the other prophets that we listed earlier, these warnings and things that were happening, and they weren't listening. God had put several men in their presence at the same time with the message, and they weren't listening. But Micah is an interesting um, small book of the minor prophets. It starts out like a shotgun blast, you could say. 
Um, there's no big introduction. There's no setting of the stage or anything. It's just a declaration of who God gave the message to, when he gave it, and who it concerns. So verse 1 says this, The word of the Lord came to Micah the Morse in the days of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. When did, you know, who did it come to? It came to Micah. When at the time of Jotham Ahab, you know, and who did it concern? The Samarian and Jerusalem. You know, the prophet Amos is about to indict Israel and, and he started out, but, you know, Amos took a different approach. Amos came on and, you know, and he gave the message and he started looking around to all the nations around him, the Gentile nations saying, here's the judgments, right? And that's how he set up the stage before he started into the judgment statements about Israel and Samaria, right? And Judah. But Micah didn't do it that way. Um, Micah took a different approach. Nothing fancy and all. He just moved right into the message that God gave him and sounded the alarm. He wasn't trying to sugar cake. He wasn't trying to ease them into it. It was just like a shotgun. Boom. Here we go. And so let's just read the first couple of verses after. We're going to read verses 2 through 5. It says, Hear. All ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft as, as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. For transgression of Jacob is all this. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Image of 2 and 5, you get this of a courtroom. You know, that's sort of the picture it's painting here. But it looks sort of like court law. And God is the judge, obviously. Who are the defendants? Judah and Samaria. And Micah is addressing all the people of the earth because God is Lord of the whole earth. He's not just talking to his people. He's talking to everybody. And it should be something that we pay attention to. When God brings judgment on a group of people, the whole world should stand up and pay attention. But we're too callous. We're too lack of concerning. And we ignore it when God deals with individuals within the church or within different things. We think, oh, that's them. It's no concern of mine. When God is in the judgment mode and we see God judging, we need to pay attention. Because it's, you know, dealing with one group, but it can be a warning to us. You know, a lot of times we may be the next to be judged in a situation if we don't change our ways. And so, he, you know, Micah's addressing all the people of the earth and, and all because all everybody's an accountable God. What's to say? One day every knee shall bow, right? Everybody is going to go before the white throne judgment if they have not been saved and pulled and you know carried up into um, the rapture of Jesus. So like I say, we have to recognize this. Now, God is both judge and witness. Unusual circumstance, right? You say kind of odd. Um, and he's from he's calling out from his holy temple where the law was kept where in the Ark of the Covenant. So that's we're talking the temple of Jerusalem, right? Now. Here's one of the things that a lot of people stumble over. A holy God must act in righteousness and judge sin. Too many people, too many Christians think God can just overlook the sin. and all. But the problem is that creates a conflict within God. If he is a righteous God, then he has to recognize it. And too many people think, well, God can just wipe it away and it's no big deal. That's not being righteous. And that would be a conflict of his character. So he will you know, deal with, you know, sin in the proper way. He is righteous and he's also a merciful God, but just because you don't like the way that righteousness will handle something, you think God's not being merciful, you know, we don't think God's being fair, but the truth of it is he's being exactly to his character and who he is. Now, today a judge enters the courtroom, what's everybody do? They stand up. And, you know, it's a symbol of respect, you know, for the judge and for the law that he represents. But nobody ever came into court the way that Micah describes coming into court. The verb to come forth means to come forth to battle. That's what Micah is saying. God has come forth not just to come into the courtroom, but he's come in to fight. He's come into a battle. 
He opens court and basically declares war. That's what Micah is talking about here. And, you know, like I say, a judge comes to a court to see that justice is done, where he or she isn't, you know, and they aren't supposed to take sides. Well, when God comes to judge nation, he has all the evidence necessary. He doesn't have to take sides. He knows what the truth is. He, he can simply judge properly and righteously. He doesn't have to call any witnesses. He already knows everything. So God is able to pour out his anger upon the people for their sins. And that is why he's coming. It's talking about makes the earth to split and the mountains melt so that the rocks flow like melted wax or a waterfall. God is coming in this mode of judgment. And the people need to look at it that way. And then God points his accusing finger at his own people. He's not worried about the Gentile nations, although they're sinful. I mean, he's concerned about them, but the group that he is dealing with is Israel and Judah. And we know that because he represents them with the capitals of Samaria and Jerusalem. And, you know, after seeing what Assyria did to Israel in 722, the leaders of Ju Judah should have repented. They had time. But probably in their arrogance thinking, well, you know, they were scared of us. We're too strong. Our city's too fortified. They didn't come mess with us. Rather than recognizing God had given them a chance to repent, they did nothing. And then during, you know, the reign of Hezekiah, the Assyrians plundered Judah. And, and like I say, they were going to take Jerusalem. God stopped them. It wasn't that the Jerusalem was too strong or the people had too vast army. God stopped them. And we know that from Isaiah. Now, both Judah and Israel guilty of idolatry. And we've spoken about the idolatry earlier. Idolatry is what? It's the rebellion against the Lord. When a nation is divided, you know, after King Solomon came to the throne, what happened? When he died and gave the throne to his son, the Israel divided because of his son's lack of wisdom and not listening to wise people, but listening to the advisors of his youth, right? And he caused Israel to split into ten tribes and two tribes. And so, like I say, when this happened... the northern kingdom established their own religious system because Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom or the other two tribes. So they didn't want the people going down there to worship God because they're afraid that they would be drawn back. So they developed their own worship system and their own God, so to speak. And so the people worshiped that way, which was contrary to God's word. But the problem of it is these things become contagious. And the people of Judah also began to worship the gods of Canaan. And their hearts were not true to Jehovah, even though they stood in the temple and offered their sacrifices to God. And I think this is interesting. Listen, to God, the temple had become like one of the high places of the hills around Jerusalem where the Jews secretly worshipped the idols and offered sacrifices there. So they corrupted or falsely worshipped in the temple of God, the most holiest place. So let's look at verses 6 or 8. Therefore I will make Samaria as a heap of a field, and as plains of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof they shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it to of the hire of, of a harlot, and they shall return to the hire and of a harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, and I will make a wailing like the dragons and mournings of the owls. The prophet responded to God's message by acting in a, as a grieving man. Micah acted like a grieving man. At a funeral. He was genuinely burdened because of what was happening to the people. And if they didn't heed God's word of what was going to happen. He was reading the judgment. He was telling them, this is coming. This is going to happen if you don't turn back. 
You know, here's your sin. Aren't you listening to God? Aren't you doing what you're supposed to do? Why won't you turn back? Now look at us as a Christian. You know, are you grieved as one who is at a funeral when a non-Christian ignores your witness about Jesus? I don't think a lot of Christians are. I think a lot of them say, well, I told them about Jesus, they didn't want it, so, you know, that's their problem. And it's because of that attitude that the churches are not growing and are getting sicker and weaker because we're not crying over the loss, we're not concerned about the loss, we're just making sure we're, we're going to get squeak through and get through the pearly gate, and if they make it, that's fine for them, but, you know, I'm not going to sweat it. And that's the wrong attitude, that's totally the wrong attitude. We need to be in tears about the lost. Now, the capital city of the northern kingdom was situated on a hill. That's why we get the description about the hill, right? And it overlooked a fertile valley, a great place for crops, right? Isaiah called the city the crown of pride with glorious beauty. Think about that. A city is, you know, the crown of pride with glorious beauty. Sounds pretty fanciful, doesn't it? Sounds like a beautiful place. And they also predicted that God's judgment would destroy the city. Guess who else is saying the city is going to be destroyed? You got it, Micah. The Assyrians would turn the beautiful city into a heap of rubble. That's what he's talking about. The beautiful city. That's what he's talking about. The city on the hill. And because of that, they're thinking, that, oh, our idols should protect us. And it, no, they're not. God's judgment's coming, and their idols aren't going to stop one bit of it. They're going to get both barrels, so to speak. Now, God destroyed the city and nation of Samaria because the people rebelled against his word. How many times do we rebel against God's word? And I think a lot of times we don't even know it. And he destroyed the Samaritan temple because it had housed a false religion. Remember, they created this false religion so the people wouldn't leave, you know, Judah. Or, excuse me, they wouldn't leave Samaria so that, you know, they'd go back over to Jerusalem. They didn't want them because they're afraid to go and stay there or fall in favor with the king over there and not come. You know, they didn't want that. So there was this false religion. And God refers to it as nothing more than religious prostitution. And that is a common description that God uses anytime somebody worships another God other than him. He calls it a prostitution or idolatry. Now, God also destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. The beautiful temple in Jerusalem he had destroyed by the Babylonians, of course. Why? Why? Because the leaders wouldn't turn back to the true religion. They also had begun to have a false religion within the temple of God, within the temple of Jehovah. You know, and God recognized they're not worshiping me. They're, they're just going through the motions. They're doing these other things. They're worshiping these other idols and participating in these other things. And, on. and he's a jealous God. Many times in scripture it just tells us God is a jealous God. And he will not share his worship with anybody. And so the covenant that God had made with his people at Sinai was like a marriage contract. And their breaking of that covenant was like committing adultery, as I said. And so here comes, you know, the destruction of the city of Samaria began in 722 under Sargon. The ruler of Syria, who were many of the citizens, be taken and captive and killed. Then he imported people into the land. Common tactic among many of the ancient conquerors. Export people out, import your people in, mix the populations all together. You don't get a rebellion back because none of them will trust each other and none were that strong to be against you. And so after killing several, a lot of citizens and taking captive and, and all, he imported just other people from other lands. 
and the Jews and Gentiles intermarried. Okay, there we go, breaking the covenant again. And they became a mixed race and they're a despised race. And even into Jesus' day, what? They still considered them a despised race after generations of generations of them living. They considered the Samaritans a dirty race. So, move on. Let's look at verses 9 through 16. For her wound is incurable, for it has come up unto Judah. He come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Declare ye it not at Gath, weep ye not at it at all. In the house of Ephrath, roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away unto the inhabitant of Sapphire. Having the shame naked, and the inhabitants of Zanon come not forth in the morning of Bethazel, he shall receive of you this standing. For the inhabitant of Morath waited carefully for good, but evil come down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot of the, to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin to the daughter of Zion. For the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore thou shalt give presents to Morsheth Gath. The houses of Ajib shall be allied to the kings of Israel. Yea, will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Morsheth. He shall come unto Adolam in the glory of Israel. Make ye bald, and poll thee for thy delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. Okay, a lot here, but it breaks down pretty easy. Now, the problem with Samaria is that she was toxic. That's what a term you might want to use. Her infection is spread into, you know, the hospital staff, you could say, or the other people, right? Um, it was over into Judah. What was going on in Samaria had moved over into Judah. Now, the prophet Micah begins to weep. He weeps over his land. And all the way that you would weep over a patient that's incurable. Um, we've seen that before, right? Many of us have. And he used a similar image to Isaiah um, to describe the plight of Judah. And Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah? We've, went, we've talked about Jeremiah before. Wept because the spiritual leaders in his day did not deal drastically with the sin and sickness of the people. Or sin sickness, I should say. Opportunity to make things better. Opportunity to get things right. And they wouldn't deal with it. They ignored it. And so with that, Micah is upset, obviously. And so Micah describes the ruin of the southern part of Judah, the Shephelah, by the invading Assyrians in 701 BC. And they came into the land, took 46 cities, but they could not take Jerusalem. Why? Because God stopped them. It was not time for Jerusalem to fall yet, so that's why they couldn't take Jerusalem. And Micah here uses a series of puns, called a little bit of sarcasm if you want or whatever, but he kind of plays around um, with the names and obviously it's purposeful. There's a reason for God to have him to do this because we get a lot of different meanings and different things. But what he did, he would take the sound of the city and the familiar Hebrew words. For example, Gath is similar to the Hebrew word for tell. Thus he wrote, tell it not in Gath. And that's what um, Ben Orpha, um, so that's some of what it says. Ben Orpha means house of dust. Thus he wrote, roll in the dust. The people of Shafir, pleasant, beautiful, would look neither beautiful nor pleasant as they were handed off as naked prisoners of war. See, he's kind of twisting it, saying that, look at this. You have some glorious names, but that's not what's going to happen. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me show you how bad it's going to get. You know, the, the roll call city went on and said the cities of Zain means come out, would not be able to come out because of the danger. So, you know, hey, come out. No, nope, they can't come out because who's sitting on their doorsteps, the Assyrians. Beth Ezel means house of taking away. And the city would be taken away. Moroth is 
related to mer or mer and means bitterness. And the city would experience bitter calamity, rith and pain. Since Lakish sounds like the Hebrew word for the team of swift horses, he warned them to harness their horses to the chariots and try to escape. You need to get out. You need to go on. Then Micah came to his own city in Morsheth, which sounds like the Hebrew word meaning betrothed. The brides are given farewell gifts. In other words, the town would no longer belong. Um, yeah. So Morsheth, in other words, the town would no longer belong to Jew, but would leave home. So he played around with that to get that turned around. The way I wrote that, I kind of threw myself there. And also, you know, you're betrothed, you're getting married, you, you know, the bride leaves home. He twisted around and said, guess what? You're leaving home. You're going into captivity. That's what he's talking about. And the Vaders will do it. Now, Ashib means deception and the connection is obvious. Mershath sounds like the word for conqueror and the town would be conquered. They wouldn't be the conquerors. They would be conquered by the enemy. So the tragedy of this invasion is not, is that it didn't need to happen. I think sometimes we read things in scripture and say, okay, this is all God's will. This needs to happen. It's going to happen regardless. I think we forget how many times, and we read it several times in scripture, where God repents of his anger. He repents of a judgment. Not meaning that he's wrong, but he changes his mind because there's been a reaction. We just read this in Jonah, right? You know, 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. And the people put on sackcloth and rem you know, were in remorse and you're know, praying to God and everything. And what's God do? He says, nope, I'm not going to destroy you, Nineveh. You've had changed your heart. That's what Micah is wanting to happen in Israel is the people will have a change of heart and be dedicated to God that he can use them and everything and that they can move forward. But instead they're going the wrong way. They're chasing other gods and idols, and it's become more important to them. It didn't need to happen, but it happened. And it affected everyone in the land, including the children. Now, like I said, we're going to stop here. We're not going to try to move on into chapter 2. But even the true worship of God in the temple of Jerusalem, the highest place of worship, had become corrupted by the desires of men. We must guard the church against this today. You say, oh, well, it never happened today. Uh, yeah, it will. And it has. And it's going to continue to happen unless people guard against it. But it's not the building that we're guarding. It's the individual. You first have to guard yourself against this deception, this corruption, this idolatry, this prostitution, and all. Because you can't let other things become before God to you. He has to be first and foremost in your life. If he's not, then you are in danger. And like I say, what creeps in? Other activities, money, wealth, other things. And we begin to focus on those things and not on God. And we worship them. And then all of a sudden, what happens? We're not the church we should be. And, you know... I can't help but wonder the number of churches that we read that close down every year. Is this the destruction of infected churches? Where God takes care better that we close the church than to let it spread a false religion or belief? There's an interesting discussion, right? But the thing of it is, maybe... These churches weren't being diligent. If that is because God closed them down because of it, maybe they weren't being diligent about what God told them to do. They weren't taking it seriously enough. The work of God and his kingdom. And I can't help but think, after reading Micah and other prophets and all, that God gives you so much time. But he says that's enough. So I'm not surprised if Many of the churches that are closing is just God dealing forth a judgment. Saying you've abandoned your roots. 
You've abandoned what it is that you believe in. You're not putting me first. And out of his jealousy and out of his anger of their sin, he closes down their churches. I can see that happening. As people are disobedient to God. So like I say, see, we're going to stop there. Um, we'll pick up next time. And I'll, I just want you to be thinking about it. Are you doing what you should be for God? And are you guarding against idolatry in your life? I think a lot of people aren't. And they're letting things creep in. And then what happens when they allow these frivolous things creep in? They to carry it to them in church. And sometimes it sticks and sometimes don't. Well, it's the same way with attitudes. I'm not going to go visit my neighbor. I'm just not comfortable doing that. And that attitude is just contagious and infectious in a church. And nobody gets visited, nobody gets invited to church, and the church will wither and die. Till the point that it gets to a point where the trustees and everybody has to turn around and say, you know what, we can't continue. It's over. And another church dies. So like I say, look at yourself and make sure you're guarded. And that you're not falling into idolatry. It's a simple trap. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, protect us and keep us. Watch over us. Father, guard our hearts and show us where we need to be strengthened. And Father, where we need to focus and turn things over to you so that we do not fall in the traps of the enemy. Lord, bless us and keep us. And Lord, we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins where we sinned against you. And Father, we pray that if anyone knows you not, that they'll turn their hearts to you and call on Jesus and be saved. Guide us and direct us in all these things. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good night.